Greetings from Great Bear Island, where the air is crisp, the fresh snow sparkles, and strange glowing wolves are slowly circling your home. I am your host, Robert York, and I'll be taking you through the midnight hour to the early morning, or until the aurora finally flares out, whichever comes first. We'll be starting with letters from the listeners. Hey Robert, I love your show. You may know me as one of the corpses outside the camp office. Before I died, it was my job to bring in all the flags before closing up for the winter. I say since we are locked in the grip of eternal ice, It really doesn't matter. I'm starting to have second thoughts about the position I took, however. I have this tendency to dig in my heels even when I'm on shaky ground. So I figured I'd ask, what is the proper way to handle a flag in the quiet apocalypse? I need to know when I meet my supervisor in the great beyond, so I should know if I should apologize to him or say I told you so. Sincerely, Frozen in a block of ice. Dear Frozen in a Block of Ice, First of all, thanks listener for your kind words. And yes, I happen to be quite the expert on flag etiquette. I happen to have a cheat sheet that I carry around at all times with me. I mean, who wouldn't, after what happened last flag day? The maple leaf flag is a statement of pride. Pride in our community pride in things that nobody shall acknowledge or speak about, pride in the utterly vulnerable status of our internal organs to moose hooves. As such, it is imperative that we show our flags the respect that the prophecies inscribed in the Book of Deer demands. Here is a list of do's, don'ts, and anti-don'ts. The flag should be raised briskly and lowered painfully. The flag should not be part of a costume or athletic uniform. The flag should never be used as a receptacle for receiving, holding, carrying, or delivering anything. When used as part of a marching ceremony, your flag should always be held on your left. The flag should always be flown at full mast, except during the following. On Boxing Day, Dentist Day, and any day the aurora is vibrating at a pitch of high C, your flag should be flown at half-staff. On days when wolves attack, leave it at a height that looks like you were dragged away kicking and screaming before you could finish. On Flag Day, Thursday, or any day the aurora is unleashing a cacophonic din of random oscillations, the flag should never be flown. When putting the flag to half-staff, always raise it fully to the top first before lowering it to the proper height. This may buy you some time. Machine wash only. Starch thoroughly. Do not burn a flag unless you seek the ire of the Elder Ones. Frayed and damaged flags should be disposed of by burning. If a flag passes you in a parade, only salute if you are in uniform. Otherwise, place your hand over your heart. If you did not bring one with you, politely ask someone next to you if they would share. If flown at night, the flag must be properly lit. If flown during the day, the flag must be properly dark. Finally, flying the flag in different manners 
has different meanings. Learn these well, or you may find yourself making placating sacrifices. Upside down indicates physical distress. Inside out indicates emotional distress. Sideways indicates no thank you. The other sideways may be interpreted as a sign of aggression to certain mammals, especially wolves. Backwards indicates that you are passive-aggressively letting your neighbor know that you are unhappy with the state of his lawn and would it kill him to shovel. Seriously, you are bringing down the property values because everybody on the block thinks you are a hobo. I don't care if you work nights and burst into flames when exposed to sunlight. Hire one of those arachnids who hang around Orca X all the time. They work for flies, and if they give you too much lip, just call Immigration and Customs Enforcement. I did that when one of them started dating my daughter. Problem solved. I hope this quick and easy guide to the care and feeding of flags was of use to you. If you haven't been feeding your flags, they can get quite ravenous. Even as we speak, one has gotten out of its cage. It's skirting across the floor, coming closer. Closer. Now would be a good time to wake up, listener. You need to wake up. Those aren't blankets you are struggling to pull off your face. You are not tangled up in the sheets. You need to wake up. You need to... Hmm. Ah, well. This has been Letters from the Listeners. And now a word from our sponsors. Our show was brought to you by Great Bear Herbal Sleepy Time Tea. The nighttime sniffling, sneezing, coughing, aching, stuffy head fever, hair standing on the back of your neck. What are those shadows doing? Oh God, it's got me. It's starting with my legs. For the love of all that is holy, just kill me. Why can't I die? This is the greatest of pain so you can sleep or you're being eaten alive medicine. Sleepy helps you get your Z's. This has been a word from our sponsors. And now a public service announcement. The following message is from the Director of Emergency Services who contacted me in a dream. There is an outbreak of some sort of disease that manifests as long tendrils that grow from the back of your head, giving you what has been termed by the Great Bear Medical Association as Eldritch Mullet Syndrome. Symptoms of EMS include a strong urge to start playing a string instrument, hair that can taste the back of your neck, and the urge to finance a tattoo. After making the announcement, the director of emergency services was attacked by a small group of blue-skinned Oni who appeared in a whirlwind of chains, flames, and hooks that lashed out with the intent of dismemberment. However, before the deadly manifestation made contact, the director collapsed into herself before exploding into a cloud of a thousand darting shadows. Each shadowy fragment reformed wherever it landed into various forms of vermin, including, but not limited to, rats, crows, improvised knives, common tools, and the occasional malnourished Sean Penn, the majority of which quickly surrounded her attackers. The Japanese demons, recoiling in fear, murmured that maybe it was time to go home, something about how it was getting late and that they needed to work in the morning. Then they all vanished in a flash of speed lines and cheap animation. At which point, I woke up. This has been a public service announcement. And now the farm report. Wait here. I'll be right back. I regretted my phrasing immediately since I knew she was not one who tolerated commands but I was already committed to my course of action. I let down my luggage carelessly, and before it had landed, I had run halfway to my room. I was followed by a light thump as they fell over, inadvertently and unintentionally making it difficult for someone to pursue me. I swung myself into the darkness of my soon-to-be-just-a-memory room, crouched in front of my desk, then reached into the inky void that was my bookshelf. It would have been helpful to flick the lights on for just a second to get that snapshot of what was in front of me, but annoyance was radiating from down the hall, and I had a feeling I was pushing her very close to her limits. I ran my fingers over pages and covers, feeling for the right texture, the right thickness, the right familiarity. 
Given the right amount of familiarity, fingers can be good eyes in the dark. In this case, my hands had spent more than enough time with every single item on this shelf. A few seconds of shuffling and two annoyed huffs from the hallway later, my fingers stopped on the glassy cover that I had sent them hunting for. Smiling, I reached deep before I pulled the book out and laid it on the desk in a single smooth motion. It's important to do these things in the right order. To get this part right, I needed light because fingers, as good as they are at picking up on shapes, can't pick up colors. Mine couldn't anyways. Not at that particular moment, at least. Now, I know that there are more talented figures out there that can pick up colors, smells, thoughts, and confused feelings, but mine were far dumber than that. Light was not an option for reasons already stated, so I had to rely on my least reliable sense, my memory. Some people don't realize that memory is a sense. They think of it as an event, or as a process, or even as a curse in certain circles. They are all quite wrong. Memory is a sense as useful as any of the others. However, there are different types of memory. The other kind is the sort of memory that remembers things before it happens. Most people know I can remember things before they happen, but few have the good sense enough to do something about it. Alas, I find that while a reliable memory can be useful, it is also painful. So it is something I try to control, not cultivate. Fiercely frowning, as if it would help steer my memory to the right place, I flipped through pages and stopped at the one that had a faint, bluish glow in the dark. It made my memory a little less uncertain than it usually felt. I grabbed hold of the blue page and ripped it off in a quick, but unfortunately loud move. At this point, I could sense the ripples of disapproval rolling in and flooding the room. So I held my breath and stepped out quickly. Most of the time, Pretending like nothing had happened doesn't make the thing that happened go away, but it can confuse witnesses long enough to give you a window of opportunity. Usually I use said opportunity to avoid immediate consequences, and that's just what I tried to do. I scooped up my luggage, stepped past her burning glare, and quipped, Shall we go, then? It didn't work. She didn't say anything, which was bad, the only thing that followed me was a vengeful stare, which was worse. I didn't know how I could tell she was doing any of this without looking at her, but I knew all too well that she was, which was probably the worst. Or rather, I did know that I knew by knowing it, but as I said before, that is usually something I try to avoid, yet another in a long list of unfortunate choices. Trying to paddle myself out of the brewing storm on the quickly disintegrating raft of pretense I had built earlier, I stepped out of the main door without hesitation, and in doing so, I quickly regretted not taking the time to take one last look at the house. Pride and a small tinge of fear held me back from turning around and saying goodbye to the small space that was once my home. A bubble of cozy, interconnected, and rectangular rooms confined by short concrete walls and glass windows, a very human nest. It was behind me, and I couldn't turn to say goodbye. Too many metaphors at the same time can have that effect on you. One should say goodbye, especially when you know this will be your last opportunity to converse with a subject. You might not think that one should say goodbye to a place, and normally, one would not. However, this place was a place of memories, and when they are interconnected in a fashion to become a home, it's best to say goodbye. It gives you a sense of closure, a bookend to place around your thoughts. Otherwise, your judgment might get muddled. How often have you found yourself thinking about events at places beckoned by a smell or a sound or a trick of light? Such unwanted intrusions can be avoided with a simple farewell. Standing there, under the light of stars and foggy moons, with thoughts of home and smells of earthly night running through my head, a breeze moved past, crisp and sharp. A new wave of emotion was building inside, 
which I knew, if not restrained, would stop me from taking another step. So it was fortunate that the Red Lady stepped out around the same time, still holding her vindictive, I can't believe you just did that stare. She didn't say anything, paused for a moment next to me, then walked away in long, swift steps. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to follow the strange woman into the unfamiliar world she was leading me to. But she had an invisible cord connecting me to her. She pulled me unwillingly, or perhaps absent-mindingly, after her. For all I knew, I was still there, standing on my porch, on the welcome rug. To be honest with you, in a way, I still am. I caught up with her seconds later, feeling a small but quickly growing knot in my chest. She must have sensed it, because she tried to distract me. What did you go back for? She demanded to know. It wasn't that she cared for what I had gone back for, or for my feelings. She just didn't want to have them surface while I was in her presence. A preemptive strike on her part. A map, I replied. A map of what? A world map. The next sound could only be described as a snort, although I'd be hard-pressed to tell you from where it originated. Where did you get it from? She asked with a slight hint of surprise in her voice. My geography textbook. What parts of the world does it map out? Just Earth. She rolled her eyes, except she didn't exactly do the human gesture that is the rolling of eyes. Instead, her ears flicked forward and her nose wrinkled, but somehow slightly unsettled. I realized that I knew what the expression meant. So that's what you call the world. She slowly shook her head. There's a universe of immeasurable space, and that's what you call it. Dirt. It's the only world I care for, I stated. She turned to me without stopping and studied my face with curiosity and disappointment. I diverted my eyes quickly and pinned them to the ground. I was angry. I was scared. I was standing on the line in defense of my world. No wonder, she replied coldly and started to walk faster. I didn't match her pace, letting the gap between us grow larger. This has been The Farm Report. Listeners, I have un- unhappy- I- Hold on, I I need a minute. Uh, um, it, it appears that a young man by the name of Everflame, known to his friends as EF, has hung himself. Now, uh, we all know that suicide is illegal, and as such, EF will be charged. But uh, given the circumstances and the violator's age, Mayor Battery assures me that EF will only receive detention and counseling. The authorities have informed me, and I quote, the criminal known as EF steadfastly and quite rudely remains dead. (sighs) Chances of successfully reviving EF are decreasing with every passing moment. He, He doesn't breathe. He's not breathing, so he... Dear dear listener, if you have any knowledge that can help, I... Please help me. Someone help me. I, I, I can't. I, I can't.